Hi to everyone and welcome to this Amatech Land webinar. Okay, right now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Derek Stewart. Derek is the Global Product Manager of Power at Amatech Land with more than 25 years experience in industrial gas measurements. He's a member of the Institute of Physics and the ASTM, contributing to several ASTM standards. As a product development specialist, he was responsible for the design of several continuous emissions monitors, including the successful Model 4500 opacity monitor, which is used to monitor particulate matter emissions in stack gases worldwide. So, Derek, welcome to today's event. It's great to have you here. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to you to get us started. So, Derek, go right ahead. Hello, I'm Derek Stewart, Global Product Manager for Power at Amatech Land. Thank you for joining me today when I'm going to talk about the latest technologies which can be used for temperature measurement in the Portland cement industry, with special emphasis on measurements in and around the kiln. The key locations for temperature measurement in the cement process are the burning zone, the material in the heating and calcining zones, the kiln shell, and the temperature of the clinker in the clinker cooler. These are different measurements and there are different challenges for each of them. No one approach is suitable for everything. The rotary kiln is the key component in any cement plant, and it is where the raw materials, predominantly limestone and clay, are converted to dicalcium silicate, or C2S, and tricalcium silicate, or C3S, which are the principal components of the clinker, which is then ground to form Portland cement. A modern dry process cement kiln is typically around 70 metres long, 6 metres in diameter, and rotates three times per minute. It's one of the largest moving items in any process industry. Control of the cement kiln is a very challenging task. Efficient and consistent production of high quality cement with the lowest environmental impact requires careful attention to the raw mix feed rate, to the fuel-air ratio in the burner, and to the temperature distribution throughout the kiln. The measurement task is made more complicated because conditions within the kiln make it difficult to measure many of these key operational parameters. Temperature measurement inside the kiln is especially challenging. Kiln rotation, high temperatures, and the movement of the sintering material along the kiln make thermocouples and other contact temperature sensors impractical. Radiation thermometers, also known as pyrometers, allow a non-contact temperature measurement, but their effectiveness is limited by the high dust loading, especially within the burning zone, also known as the firing zone. Nevertheless, burning zone temperature is an important measurement because it shows whether there has been a complete transformation from C2S to C3S. That's a process which occurs in the region of 1300 to 1450 degrees Celsius, or 2372 to 2642 degrees Fahrenheit. Here we have a view along a cement kiln, with the raw materials moving from left to right within the kiln. The firing pipe coming in from the right carries the fuel and air to the burner, which provides the heat for the whole process. The burning zone is the hottest part of the process, and this is where the clinker leaves the kiln. The firing hood encloses the hot end of the kiln, and the burner is located within the hood. A conventional pyrometer does not work well inside a cement kiln because of the high concentration of dust, smoke, and other particles causing high obscuration. For this reason, many kilns use a ratio pyrometer to measure the burning zone temperature. This is much less susceptible to errors caused by obscuration from dust because it uses the ratio between the radiation intensity at two wavelengths instead of the absolute intensity at a single wavelength. Combined with a peak picker algorithm, a ratio thermometer can give an accurate temperature measurement even when there's 95% obscuration in the field of view. A viewing port within the firing hood and located below and to the side of the burner allows the best measurement of the clinker temperature in the burning zone. If the kiln rotates anti-clockwise as shown here, the best location is around 8 o'clock, 
with the pyrometer pointing across and towards the half past three position. Here we can see an Amatec land pyrometer installed adjacent to the burner. This is a very aggressive location with lots of vibration and high ambient temperatures, so it's important that the pyrometer and its mounting are designed for the application. The pyrometer generally has to be installed with a water-cooled jacket to prevent damage to the electronics. An air purge is essential on the process connection to protect the delicate optical surfaces from the hot and dusty gases within the kiln. The main disadvantage of the ratio thermometer is that it gives only a single measurement value from a small part of the kiln. Because of this, its readings can be deceptive if the target area is not optimised. A more modern approach is to use a short wavelength thermal imager with a near infrared sensor and bore scope probe. This gives much more information about conditions within the burning zone. Bore scopes have been used for many years for inspection and diagnostic purposes, but it's only fairly recently that infrared versions have been developed for thermal imaging applications. Here we see a typical installation with the bore scope mounted adjacent to the firing tube. As with the pyrometer, it needs water cooling and air purge to protect it from the aggressive environmental and process conditions. The bore scope itself is only 61 millimeters or 2.4 inches in diameter and that includes the water cooled jacket. Because of this it can be inserted through a small viewing port without major disruption to the process. To minimize exposure to the aggressive process conditions, the tip of the bore scope should be slightly recessed into the wall. This doesn't affect its function and the large 90 degree by 67 degree field of view enables it to form an image of the relevant parts of the process. Bore scope optics are rather expensive, so we want to be sure they won't be damaged if the purge air or cooling water are lost temporarily. An automatic retraction system is therefore a valuable safety precaution. The purpose of this system is to withdraw the entire instrument from the process if it detects either a failure of the purge air or of the cooling water. Both electrical and pneumatic retraction systems are available. The one here is electrically operated and it shows the entire bore scope in the withdrawn position. Here we have a pneumatic withdrawal system with the bore scope fully inserted into the kiln. Because there are no electrical or electronic components, a pneumatic system can tolerate higher ambient temperatures and so offers better reliability in the most aggressive applications. Pneumatic actuation is the norm in the glass industry, where temperatures are even hotter than those in a cement kiln. This is the same installation as the previous slide, but it shows more clearly the installation location in respect of the rotary kiln. In this case, the kiln is rotating clockwise, so we're looking from right to left across the kiln to see the burning zone and the clinker. The wide angle image with high spatial resolution allows accurate temperature measurements and important information about the process conditions within the burning zone. Here we see an image taken inside the kiln using an Amatec Land NIRB bore scope. The image processing software can be configured to measure multiple regions of interest and, as with a ratio pyrometer, a peak picker allows accurate measurements to be made even when there is significant obscuration. The system here has been configured to measure the temperatures of the burner flame, the clinker and the refractory. The circled region shows the flame and as you can see from the table at the bottom right, the temperature is 1594 degrees Celsius or approximately 2900 degrees Fahrenheit. The circled region here shows the clinker leaving the kiln. A peak picker algorithm is used to discriminate between the hot clinker and the cooler background region. The region of interest here shows the temperature of the refractory. That's important so we know the refractory is in good condition and the measured value shown in the table on the bottom right is 1396 Celsius which is roughly 2550 degrees Fahrenheit. The thermal image also provides valuable qualitative information such as flame propagation and formation of ash rings within the kiln. Because of its long wavelength, 
the near infrared image suffers less from scattering by particles within the field of view than a conventional video camera or borescope operating at visible wavelengths. This makes it especially valuable as it can measure temperature and provide high quality process imaging at the same time. Although the borescope is a powerful tool for measurements in the firing zone, it cannot see further along the kiln, so it has no way of measuring the temperatures in the heating and calcining zones. An elegant non-contact method for temperature measurements in the heating and calcining zones is to mount a thermal well through the refractory and view it with a pyrometer mounted close to the kiln. This arrangement allows accurate measurements without the drawbacks associated with mounting a thermocouple inside the kiln where it's liable to be damaged. The pyrometer makes a measurement once every rotation of the kiln, so we get updates approximately every 20 seconds. Because it's separate from the kiln, the pyrometer can easily be accessed for calibration or adjustment even while the kiln is in operation. Another parameter of great importance to plant reliability is the kiln shell temperature. The steel shell of the kiln has a melting point of around 1300 Celsius or 2372 Fahrenheit and the maximum practical temperature is below 500 degrees Celsius or 932 Fahrenheit. That means the shell needs to be protected from the hot feed and the gases within by a thick brick layer of the factory bricks. As well as low thermal conductivity to protect the shell, the refractory bricks are chosen to be physically stable and resistant to abrasion and to withstand the highly basic chemistry of the clinker. Over time, chemical changes in the surface of the refractory bricks can lead to spalling and overheating in the burning zone can cause rapid deterioration. Sudden mechanical damage is also possible, especially if the kiln shell distorts because of uneven rotation. No matter what the underlying cause is, deteriorating refractory leads to an increase in kiln shell temperature. Because of this, measuring the shell temperature allows the operator to monitor the long-term changes in the refractory and to detect loss or damage to individual refractory bricks. Several approaches can be taken to measuring kiln shell temperature. Point measurements can be made using thermocouples with wireless transmitters, but it's impractical to install enough sensors to detect the condition of individual refractory bricks. A handheld pyrometer can be used to make repeated measurements with good coverage but the results depend on the skill of the operator and obviously real-time measurements are not possible. A handheld thermal imager allows the operator to visualise the kiln shell and identify hotspots, but it's also non-continuous. A fixed industrial thermal imager is another option, but it's difficult to get a satisfactory image of a long, thin object, such as a kiln, using a conventional image sensor. That's because you need a wide-angle lens to cover the whole length of the kiln. For a 70 meter or 230 foot long kiln using a 640 by 480 pixel image sensor, an individual pixel covers an area of 4.3 inches or 110 millimeters. That makes it very difficult to detect damage to an individual refractory brick. The most effective tool for continuous measurements of kiln shell temperature is a line scanning infrared sensor. This uses a single detector with a scanning mirror to repeatedly scan along the length of the kiln giving the equivalent of a 1000 pixel resolution. Rotation of the kiln allows the scanner to build up an image of the kiln shell. Using a single sensor allows for excellent consistency of measurement when compared to a thermal imager. That's because even the best image sensors exhibit considerable pixel to pixel variability, whereas the scanner uses the same sensor for every point in the measurement. This image shows the temperature map of a kiln shell. The upper part of the display shows the temperature map of the entire shell and the lower graph shows the profile lengthways along the kiln. It's clear that a hot spot is developing because of damage to the refractory lining. This shows as both a bright spot in the upper map and as a peak in the profile. It's important to limit the scan angle to 90 degrees or less. A wider angle allows a scanner to be mounted closer to the kiln, but the surface emissivity of the kiln decreases rapidly at high angles leading to increased measurement uncertainty. In addition, the image spots become very elliptical, leading to degraded spatial resolution. If it's impossible to set the scanner back far enough to obtain a full view of the kiln, 
Image processing software can stitch the output of multiple scanners to give a single display. This approach also allows enhanced spatial resolution on a long kiln as it effectively doubles the number of pixels in each scan. A line scanner is a robust and compact solution for temperature measurement. Different mountings are available and may be required depending on the details of the installation. This image shows an Amatec Land LSP HD mounted in a ragged protective enclosure with a narrow viewport. Here we can see the line scanner looking down at the kiln with a firing hood under the roof at the left hand side. The Amatec Land LSP HD has a scan angle of 80 degrees. So a single scanner head needs to be set back around 45 metres or 145 feet to measure the length of a 70 metre to 30 foot long kiln. That setback can be halved if two scanners are used. The final measurement application we will look at today is the temperature of the clinker in the clinker cooler and subsequently on the conveyor that carries it to the pulverising mill. The clinker cooler comprises a moving grate over which air is blown and the hot air exiting the clinker cooler is carried to the burner, since it's more efficient to burn the fuel using hot air from the cooler than it would be to use cold ambient air. The key requirement for the clinker cooler is to ensure that the clinker is cooled sufficiently that it cannot cause damage or fire when it leaves the metal grate of the cooler and goes on to a conventional conveyor belt. It would be possible to use a simple single point pyrometer to measure the average temperature of the clinker as it's transferred to the conveyor. But this carries the risk that the measurement could miss a small amount of hot clinker, since a small hot inclusion will make very little difference to the average temperature that we measure. In addition to the risk of a fire, a damaged conveyor can halt production until the belt is repaired, so transferring hot clinker to a conveyor can cause expensive downtime. This is an excellent application for the line scanner, as it can simply be mounted above the material to give continuous high-resolution temperature measurements across its full width. The scanner can be mounted at the end of the clinker cooler, at the transfer point, or towards the beginning of the conveyor belt. As with the kiln measurement, the scanning mirror repeatedly scans across the scene, while the movement of the conveyor carries the material along in the second dimension. In this way, we are able to build up a two-dimensional thermal image of the material as it passes by. There's only one moving part in the line scanner, the scanning mirror itself, and this has been designed to give many years of reliable service. The internal components are protected by a robust sapphire window, which is resistant to damage either from impact or from scratching. As I indicated previously, the Amatec Land line scanner has an 80 degree field of view. If it's mounted above a 4 foot wide conveyor, 1.3 metres, it needs to be set back around 2.5 feet or 75 centimetres to allow it to image the full width of the conveyor. It has a thousand discrete measurement points across the image, so the spatial resolution is of the order of 1.3 millimetres, less than a tenth of an inch. Here we see a hotspot IR scanner mounted above a conveyor. Depending on the exposure to mechanical hazards, the installation can be quite simple, as in this case, or the scanner can be placed in a toughened enclosure similar to that used for the kiln scanner application. A line scanner generates a lot of data. A thousand measurement points per scan and 100 to 150 scans per second means 100,000 plus data points. That amount of information can be very valuable in an application like the kiln shell measurement, but here it's simply a source of confusion. The solution is to process all of the data to give a single valuable output number, the maximum temperature within each scan. Here we see the new Land LMG Mark II processor, which is capable of displaying the highest temperature in a single scan measured by up to four separate hotspot IR conveyor monitors. The LMG also has a high-speed alarm relay, which can be set to give an indication of an excess temperature above a certain threshold. Modern temperature measurement techniques give many insights into all aspects of cement kiln operation, allowing for improvements to product quality, reduced fuel consumption, and improved reliability. Borescope images of the firing zone are especially valuable as they provide insights which are not accessible using other techniques. Thermowells allow measurements in otherwise inaccessible areas of the kiln, 
and line scanners can be used for cooling shell temperature measurements and to detect hot inclusions which can cause damage on conveyors. That's all I have for now, so thank you for joining me in today's webinar. If you have any questions, I'll be delighted to answer them now. Okay, Derek, thanks so much for that great presentation. Now, we do have some questions that have come in from our attendees. Here's your first question. Why does the infrared borescope give a better image than an ordinary camera? Going back to high school physics, infrared radiation and visible light are both types of electromagnetic radiation. Particles scatter ele electromagnetic radiation depending on the ratio of its wavelength to the particle size. Because of that, the infrared radiation, which has roughly twice the wavelength of visible light, is scattered much less, and so we're able to see through the particle-laden gases in the kiln. And thank you, Derek, for that answer. Here's another question. Does water vapor and carbon dioxide affect the infrared image? That's a good point. Both water vapor and carbon dioxide absorb infrared radiation. However, there's no absorption by either of these species in the 1000 to 1100 nanometer region where the uh, borescope operates. Therefore, they don't affect the signal and they don't affect the reading. And again, thanks for that answer. Here's another question. What happens if the borescope loses cooling water or purge air? The borescope probe and optics can't withstand the high temperature in the kiln without cooling water, so they'll be badly damaged within a few minutes unless the probe is withdrawn from the process. Losing purge air is less serious because it takes a while for the dust particles in the kiln to cause damage, but it's still not a good idea to leave the probe in the kiln without purge air. That's why we always recommend an automatic retraction system in all borescope installations. And thanks again for that answer, Derek. The next attendee asks, does the borescope always require water cooling? Basically, yes. We've looked at an air-cooled version for temporary installations, but it's difficult to provide enough cooling using air. Water is a much, much more efficient cooling medium, so we can take a lot more heat out of the probe if we use water cooling. And thank you again. Let's take a look and see what the next question is. Does the material of the thermo well affect the temperature measurement? In general, the emissivity of a material does affect temperature measurement, so it's necessary to apply a correction. However, a cavity such as a thermo well has an emissivity that's very close to one, so no correction is needed in this case. Okay, Derek, thanks for that answer. Looks like we've got a lot of questions that came in. Here's your next one. Can the line scanner detect distortion of the kiln shell? We can't measure distortion using the infrared sensor, but our kiln shell software will accept rotation sensor inputs. That means we can display a tire slip alongside the shell temperature measurement on a single display. Okay, great. Thank you for that answer. Here's another question. What is the smallest sized fire brick the line scanner can detect? A single line scanner has a resolution of 1,000 points per scan. So with a 70 meter long kiln, the resolution is about 70 millimeters, roughly two and a half inches. Two scanners will double the resolution, so it's possible to resolve features around 35 millimeters or just over an inch across. Okay, and moving on to another question. Does the kiln rotation speed affect the resolution of the line scanner image? A kiln typically rotates three times per minute, or once every 20 seconds. With a scan rate of 150 scans a second, that means we get 3,000 scans for every kiln rotation. That puts each scan roughly three millimeters or an eighth of an inch apart, so we aren't limited by the kiln rotation speed. Okay, your next question asks, how far from the clinker cooler does the hotspot IR scanner have to be mounted? The land hotspot IR has a scan angle of 80 degrees, so you can calculate the minimum height using trigonometry. As a quick calculation, uh, that height would be equal to the belt width divided by 1.7. 
As a bit of background, the 80 degree figure was chosen to give good coverage, but to avoid the distortions that would result with a very wide scan. In the middle of the scan, the measured spot is symmetric, its width is equal to its length. As you scan out to higher angles, the spot becomes elongated in the scan direction. So with a scan angle of 80 degrees, at the edge of the field of view, the spots have an aspect ratio of about 1.3 to 1. If we went out to a wider scan, maybe a 120 degree angle, uh, that distortion would increase and you'd actually get a spot with an aspect ratio of 2 to 1, which isn't really giving you the spatial resolution that you're looking for. Okay, great. Thanks for that answer. We've got time for another question. Let's take a look. Can an infrared scanner detect a piece of hot clinker that is buried beneath the surface? Unfortunately, the hotspot IR uses infrared radiation and not x-rays, so it cannot see beneath the surface of the material on the kiln cooler. There are some advantages if you measure at the transfer point where the material leaves the cooler, as it tends to spread out there, so you're more likely to see hot items in the middle of the falling stream. However, by that point, it's getting rather difficult to divert the material from the conveyor. Okay, Derek, thanks for all those answers, and we're going to have to wrap things up right there. So, Derek Stewart, thanks so much for taking the time to be here with all of us today. And we'd certainly like to say a special thank you to all of our audience members for being part of this webinar event. Take care and have yourselves a great day.